Welcome back to the Tide Generator Podcast. Today's episode is about what's memorable now. The experience design and AV worlds are all about creating memorable events and engaging installations. Frequently, what makes something memorable are elements of spontaneity and surprise, moments of human connection. Now, with those connections strictly regulated for health and safety, we wonder, what is memorable now? How can we foster the happenstance interactions between people in spaces designed for social distancing? And what will we cherish most about experiencing public venues together again? Welcome back to the Tide Generator podcast. Today we're going to be talking about what's memorable, and especially what's memorable now. Um, The AV and experience design industries are really focused on creating memorable experiences And as we reframe how people come together in spaces and how they share experiences, we're going to take a look at the elements that make things memorable and create connection within groups and how we're going to be able to sustain and create new ways of fostering those connections as we come together in new socially distant and uh, carefully organized and choreographed spaces. Um, Here with me to talk about those topics are two people who work in very different and very um, overlapping, actually, versions of experience design. Um, Today we have Paul Chavez, who is an associate uh, specializing in technology and user experience with Arup. Welcome, Paul. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And I also have Nathan Atkinson. He's director of strategy and an associate creative director with Local Projects. Hank, you for joining us. Hi, Kirsten. It's great to be here. Ah, yeah, thank you. Um, so today we want to talk about what makes experiences memorable and how that might, how we're adjusting to this new reality. And maybe to talk about that, maybe we'll just start at the beginning and talk a little bit about how some key elements of experience design are fostering those sort of happenstance occasions where people bump into each other or people make new connections within a space. Um, I guess, how do you see that as, how do you see that as being a part of what makes an experience memorable? Um, uh, Yeah, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, We, you know, I think one of the mainstays of memorability is often surprise and and uh, um, the unexpected, and I think that uh, any any kind of circumstances in which you 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 sort of um, encounter things that you that um, uh, by chance I think have the potential to be memorable. Um, I think uh, today, quite possibly, um, the the ability for those kind of happenstance. Uh, uh, accidental events has really reduced quite a bit. I don't know what you think, Nathan, but this is, I think, one of the challenging aspects and one of the aspects that makes maybe time pass in a different sort of way now than it used to because um, because these sort of memorable events maybe are happening less frequently. And so we don't, we don't have as quite as good of milestones in our, in our memory. Right. I think, this moment that we're living in is interesting in how it, it throws into relief uh, both the, the, the values that really matter to people as well as I think it gets us as experienced designers thinking about what is, what is universal in terms of what makes a memorable experience. And so I've noticed that there, there are two things that are almost at complete opposite ends of the spectrum that, that can be memorable. And so the one is, uh, kind of novelty, which is what I think you're, you're starting to talk about, the um, kind of the surprises that happen in in-person experiences, seeing something new and different, um, if, if there's still a purpose to it, not just something that's random and novel, but something that's uh, kind of brand new and surprising for a purpose. But then it's completely the opposite end of the spectrum is, is, is rituals, are things that we do over and over and they're kind of the same. And that can be either uh, in-person meetings or events 
uh, often that are very casual, but also that's kind of designed into the way that we behave with our devices, right? They're kind of a, a ritual. And you just think about when Apple or anybody changes a feature, changes a gesture, they've kind of broken the ritual and people, uh, that's, that's perhaps memorable in a bad way. Hey, remember, remember that feature that I really love and get really used to? Remember when they changed it with iOS 8? I hate that. Um, so I think it, it's kind of interesting that you can find what's memorable uh, on either end. I, I think that's, that's really uh, super interesting, Nathan. Uh, uh, the, the thing that I think about, I, I totally agree, ritual, uh, rituals at, at a higher level maybe now, obviously, because we're, we're doing these routines. I think what might be worth talking about is the, the way that time changes in ritual versus the, 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 the novel and, and ritual tends to, I would say, tends to expand time, you know, when it, it tends to give you, lose, let you lose track of time in some respects and, 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 and not necessarily have to pay attention to it. And then, and then, then the novel is a marker in time. And so therefore, you, 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 you know, it, it passes in a little more measured kind of way. What do you, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, do you feel like you, you have more time now than you used to, or do you feel like you have less time? At least for me, in the beginning when all this started, you know, it was a, it was a disaster, and I, I felt like we were all working double time to try to figure out what was going on, and there were tons of inefficiencies, and we were trying to hang on to some of the old ways that we'd uh, behaved, uh, you know, two or three months ago. But since then, I think it's, it's leveled out. We've figured out what really works and what really matters. And I feel like I've had more time and more intentional time. That's so interesting because I would, based on behavior, I would say it's maybe the opposite for me in that, and that we were looking for things to spend time on earlier on. And what's, what seems to be happening now is is that we've filled the time with with work we've gotten used to the pace of it and so we figured out that we can fill time uh, uh now you know more and and i don't know if that means we had we have more time because we're doing in some ways we're doing more maybe because it is so concentrated um we're not moving around there's this element of efficiency in what we're doing right now, because everything is right here, and, and for the most part, and so and so we do. I think we do get a lot more done. And I'm talking to people within our company that that feel like we're getting a lot more done these days. Is that? I mean, and that's sort of off topic a little bit, but but it's, it is this matter of time, and time is an important part of of, of experience, I think, and how we're experiencing it today. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, that. I think. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, perhaps some of that, I, I sometimes hate to attribute things just to different geographical differences, but sometimes I think it is real, right? You're, you're on the West Coast and we're here on the East Coast. And uh, after living in New York for 10 years, it feels like my life was scheduled within an inch of what was possible. And so now I've, I'm still in New York, but I've escaped upstate. And so I think there, there might be a little bit more of, yeah. let's say, that California vibe. <laughs> uh, so I feel slightly less scheduled. And in the beginning, I think once everybody saw that everything could be a meeting uh, that could happen on Zoom, it could just be back to back to back. It was like that for a little while. Um, but, but now, at, at least the groups that I'm working with have, I think, turned a corner from that. And I'm, I'm at least liking the direction that it's moving. Yeah, that really makes me, all of this makes me think about how we're all gaining a new appreciation for the the space that we now have in our schedule. And at first, it, it yeah, it felt like this indeterminate amount of time. We were suddenly filling an excess of time. It was slow. It was sludgy. How are we going to fill all this time? We were trying to find things to occupy it. And now we've expanded into the space a little more fully, and we're realizing we like this pace and we like not being over scheduled and. Um, just even just traveling between events, that being gone is an interesting way to regain time. And that makes me think about as, as people come back into experiences that you're creating, um, do you think that people are going to have a different expectation in terms of 
like if they're looking for an element of joy or an element of spontaneity or or connection or, or mindfulness are you going to be able to play with the notion of time a little differently in in an experience that's interesting i don't think yet uh i've thought about that specifically as a kind of design principle now in any any different way but what i what i have been thinking about is uh, some of the conversations that we've had, even among the, the three of us, have been about when we go to this virtual world, what, what do we really miss? And I think the, the first answer that a lot of people would give is we, we need to engage more of the senses that we're to be, to be fully operational humans. We have all the senses that go beyond uh, what we use in a virtual meeting like this. But I've actually started to reconsider that. I'm, I'm not sure that actually what we need, let's say, is for Zoom to have a bunch of haptics and to uh, uh, pipe in conference room smell and all of that. Uh, I think there are, there are moments when being able to make eye contact and having the webcam on is really great, but there have been other times in the last two or three months when I'm really glad that I was able to do something else actually away from the desk, but still be listening. And so I think what's great. And when people are designing any new systems for the point that we're at to think about the on and off switch of the different components, meaning it doesn't have to be all on all sensory all the time. Give us the opportunity to choose how deep we want to go at any given minute. And so I'll just give one sort of example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a virtual daybreaker. If you're familiar with daybreaker, it's a it's an early morning kind of sober dance party that happens in a lot of different um, cities. And, stuff. and it, it's awesome. It's really energizing. It's really fun. I, I haven't been to a physical one in years and years, but someone said they're doing a, a virtual one. It's going to start with yoga and then there's going to be some music. And I tuned in mainly for the yoga, for the exercise. And then when the DJ started playing, I, I felt no need to dance in my home, but I listened to the music while I did something else and I didn't have a camera on, but there were hundreds of other people who what they needed actually was to be on camera and be dancing and see other people dancing. So that worked for them. My situation of kind of dipping in halfway worked for me. Uh, and I think that, that paradigm could work for a lot of different situations, including things more serious than dance parties. No, I, I think that that, that um, ties into to this, also this maybe flexibility with space in, in future designs, the, the idea of, of, of the screen space and the, and the online space versus the physical space and how we are we're going to one of the i think mutations that's occurring because of this is is that we'll be way more fluid in transitioning from from screen space to physical space and and combining these hybrids and and all of that this fluidity is is off is going to you know head off in new directions for us and the way that we leverage you know somebody on screen and somebody in the physical space uh, I, I think there there'll be some some creativity around that i i think more uh, uh, sometimes around practical applications of technology and so one of the things that uh, Kirsten and I were talking about is how meetings, what, what is the fully hybrid, uh, you know, uh, meeting these days and how, what technologies are needed to enable, um, enable that use of space, physical space. And then you've got all the, you've got, you know, half the people on screen and, and leveraging this, this, this transition between the two is going to be quite challenging. Uh, um, I have the same experience that you have as far as, taking my screen around with me outdoors while I'm working. The other day, uh, my friends at Electronic Countermeasures were, were DJ, VJing like a, a party. It was a birthday party. So it was like this mashup of Zoom and VJing like in a club. And so there were all these overlays and, and, and people were dancing in Zoom windows. And, and it was just like complete uh, kind of a new experience. Very similar, it sounds like, to, to what you've seen. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, the highlight of that, by the way, was at the the DJ played YMCA at the end, and it was, <laughs> you know, to see the people interacting with Zoom uh, with the song. I think I, it was it was an interesting uh, view of the future or view of the present, whatever. Yeah, I think what's going to emerge are, and they're already emerging, are new new behaviors that we don't really have language for yet. We still, we have language for the for the experiences that we're used to. And we try to, we tack the word virtual on front of, on the front of it and then say, it's a virtual meeting. It's a virtual dance party, but it's kind of becoming something else. And what, what I've noticed also is uh, the experiences work better. They're more memorable to Kirsten's question when they, they aren't just trying to mimic what we're used to. Exactly. There was a, a, a conference that um, I I went to <laughs> right after uh, we all had to lock ourselves up in our homes, and it was it was exactly the same format, the same schedule that a typical conference would have been, and it was not it was not great. You don't you don't want to sit in your chair for that long. One of the best things about a conference isn't really the scheduled programming. It's all this, the spontaneity and the wandering around and meeting new people. Um, in the way that conferences just have to work usually is you have to, you have to rent a venue for a certain amount of time. So you just try to pack as much as you can into that time that it's been rented. If, if it's not in physical space anymore, it doesn't have to do that. So we can think about, is there such a thing as a, uh, we need another word beyond conference, but it's something that you can dip in and out of over the course of six months. And uh, I almost wonder if curricula is a better maybe analogy, meaning it's, it's not just three, three days of really, really hardcore talks. It's a, uh, it's a path that you're on for six months that has some kind of focus. We may, we may get more out of that. Nathan, what do you think about the the sense of liveness versus pre-recorded content in those in those environments? I mean, is is there? I, I personally feel like there's a certain um, there's a a real value to something that is being broadcast live, and I think that it's something that the format, you know, the um, uh, Instagram and and other or other places have leveraged this before, but to, but today it's even more valuable. I feel like the more valuable thing that I can watch online is the one that's actually live. Yeah, this this daybreaker party that I'm talking about, the the DJs were were actually mic'd up and were watching the grid of dancers and were commenting on them live. And there, there was something special and effective about that uh, to, to put it in comparison to if you were just listening to canned, you know, Spotify, you have the feeling, oh, I, I can pause this. I can come back to this later. Uh, but it, it's not at all the same if it's a, a live event. It reminds me, do you know Pop-Up Magazine? Are you familiar with that series? I don't think so. Oh, it's, it's awesome. It's the... It's a series of live events. They, they tour around. They have an issue every quarter, every season. And it is mostly journalists, but really they're kind of giving a performed staged reading of a piece that they've done with musical and often projected or animated um, visuals there. But they're very clear at the beginning of every issue we're not recording this. We're not putting it online. We've made it just for you. And you, you, right, you hear that something about the scarcity of that makes you pay attention, but there's exactly no reason right. really why we couldn't also do that. Even, you know, even with this, where you, you, sure. if you want to hear it, you got to tune in. This is only happening now. Yeah. There's something about that, the ephemeral nature of that, like this will disappear unless I tune in now. And I, and I will keep my eyes locked on it longer. If I, if I worry that I might miss something, I might miss the DJ calling someone out on something. Um, I've been obsessing over the Cornell bird feeder cam. Um, and I, every morning when I wake up, I hurry to see if I can see the person who refills the seeds. <laughs> 
This is my greatest thrill right now. Have you caught them yet? Yes. Uh, I, now I know what time. <laughs> and this morning, I took so much joy in it um, because there was a couple new things he did. And <laughs> that is what I live for. And again, my eyes are, I'm, I'm staying on that because yeah, I'm not going to click away from that because what, when I, what might I miss? Um, and that's just a guy and a bird feeder. Even oh. the birds, like the spontaneity of the birds showing up, is an, is an, I'm finding it to be just endlessly captivating. <laughs> I mean, I so think I've been thinking a lot about it. Yeah. yeah, it's something that you don't have in your in your immediately immediate vicinity, but you can still experience in this live way. And there's there's something there's something really about it. There was a uh, a live uh, cast the other day in in a zoo that that you know they were, they were showing these animals. So this this connection, yeah, this real time connection is um, something I seek out. And I've been advising, you know, customers that are doing live theater or live music and that sort of thing that um, that, that do, you know, that do real live when, when we're back in, in spaces, but that they really need to leverage uh, the live liveness of, of streaming and that sort of thing. And I think, I think streaming and Zoom, there, there are some big benefactors uh, in the technology side of things that, um, that will change real real spaces in the future um, and, and it, you know, become these hybrids. Mm -hmm. Something I've noticed too uh, is I, I felt actually more connected to people in these virtual environments when the camera has been off and we've been, we've been away from our desks or doing something else. So either cooking together, uh, watching a film together, uh, just some other actual human activity beyond sitting in a chair. Uh, I, I was, I never been an online video game player, but I'm, I'm trying all of these new things at this time. So right. I got a headset uh, and I'm playing some of that with some friends. And so you hear them and you can talk to each other, but you, you, you're, you're actually doing something. So you don't have the kind of force, let's try to make eye contact through a webcam, which something about that feels so much less natural than let's just talk, let's do things, but we can talk to each other and listen to each other. And I, I don't know if you've heard about this. This is a theory someone put out that has kind of stuck with me about why men in particular seem to socialize by doing things like playing video games and watching sports, fishing, it's because, according to this theory, when men have to make sustained eye contact for a long time, it initiates a kind of alpha male competition, and it's kind of uncomfortable. But if they're sitting side by side and the gaze is at something else, then, you know, the, the fishing just ends up sort of being this uh, visual distraction, and then they can talk about what they really want to talk they about. They can commune then. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and they talk about that too, the side-by-side -side walking conversation. Um, right. we, actually, in our earliest discussions about what we might want to bring to the virtual world, it's more the feeling of walking through a space with somebody or riding in a car with somebody because it does change the conversation. Yeah, that's a definitely an interesting point. I've been experimenting the last couple of weekends with a, a program called Jam Kazam, which is basically kind of a low latency tool for musicians. Um, you can you it, it, it requires, for example, that you plug in, uh, you know, with a hard wire to your router so that, you know, it can reduce the latency just that much more. And it's not perfect, but um, it is interesting, you know, to have this different oral experience with with music instruments and you can turn on the camera. And I don't know that it really gives you anything other than getting everything set up. But um, but you can really, you know, jam with with other other friends and last weekend we had three of us uh, you know experimenting in live so i, I think i i think uh, that that it's a, sort of the secondary sensory experience that that we can have today and we need mm -hmm. there's kind of a related idea that we think about in particular when we do design of experiences for museums that we we call it triangulation. When you have two individuals who are uh, interacting with something, they're interacting with, you know, whatever. But then the third leg of the triangle is, is drawn and connected between them. Like I'm making something, you're making something. And then we turn and we say, oh, what did you make? Oh, what did you make? 
and it completes the triangle and then you have this really special social experience. Yeah, I think that's interesting. There's a whole bunch of themes here. You know, humans love live. We do love the notion of live and something happening in real time. And But we also like the level, different levels of participation. And I think that might be the, th we're definitely learning that. that. That's like big time, like whether or not we want to be seen dancing, we want to be thrown up on a big screen and <laughs> highlighted, or if we just want to listen. And I think there's going to be a more selective nature to the way we approach, especially as we have these hybrid experiences i mean to nathan's point earlier about about moving around with the screen too i mean i think that this this headshot thing we've got we've got to create different different viewports soon <laughs> getting really <laughs> sick of this you know this this perspective so uh um you know i think i think a variety one of the things that we should be experimenting with is a, a variety of cameras and a variety of places that 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 we can switch to easily and and mobile devices obviously provide that but mm -hmm. um but this this kind of uh you know expansion of this of this viewport pretty pretty important too so we're learning a lot <laughs> and now we, we have to think <laughs> we're learning about you know i've been obsessing over listening to live recordings of music because i miss audience noise um i kind oh. of wonder how we're gonna um as we you know there's been a couple concerts now where they've done socially distant audiences um i i'm i'm kind of hoping that we can pipe in remote audience noise to help fill in for those physical gaps in the space. Um, there are a couple of audience response systems that are that, that we're playing with now that, that uh, you know, mostly I think allow you to interact with buttons. And that's, I think that's, that's suboptimal. Ideally, mm -hmm. you would be able to sort of chime in with your own voice, but I think there, there are bigger challenges with that sort of thing. I, I kind of wonder whether Alexa and Google have uh, have a, a place to play here and that they're already listening to you anyway so could you could you somehow have a, a a wake word that is cheering that that cheering if you know you're watching if it knows you're watching a game or a or a, an event you know can can it just take your cheers that are happening in your home and 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 you know retransport them and re replay them in the venue mm -hmm. i think there are, I think about live experiences as having three, three components. And usually people only think about the second one. Um, there's the, the planning or the preparation before the actual event itself. And that can either happen just the individual does it themselves, or if it's a social experience, we do it together. And a lot of studies have shown that that's actually sometimes even more meaningful. They talk about this with long, long trips, the planning and the excitement that you get leading up to a trip sometimes is even more rewarding to people than the trip itself. Then, then there's the, the trip or the event or the a visit or the concert or whatever. And then there's the reflection or the memory recall after it. And so all of those are really important. And I think as designers, we, would do well to, th to think about all three moments, to not just imagine that the, plan the planning will happen, the, the memory will happen later, but to actually think about them as all three beats of, of the experience, to ask people bef before you, to design into the experience, before you uh, come to this live concert, like how, how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna behave? What, did we listen to the album first? What did you think of it? What are you gonna be listening for when they're playing live? Things like that. Yeah, we love the anticipation. We like that people always say, just put a simple thing on your calendar because it does it improves your well-being and, and sense of, of contentment if you know you have something to look forward to, even if it's a minor thing. And and now I find myself looking forward to the bird feeder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm just I think that this could be. A, yeah, I like that plan. I, I like all three elements. Um, and I think, uh, Nathan, we've talked before, too, about the memor the memorable aspect being something that people will we want. <laughs> We want to have people literally have kind of a clear message. We want to deliver to them something that they will talk about when they leave. Like as, as event planners, as experienced designers, 
we can actually sort of curate what they might talk about afterward. And that, that's a really interesting aspect of all of this. I, I, find, it, I, I find that preparation part uh, uh, interesting today. At least I'm having trouble kind of um, aggregating all of the potential things that I can experience, especially, uh, like I said, I'm looking for live events. Um, um, and, and, and they're coming from a million different directions, right? I mean, and, and some, some of them I've set up with, a, with, with notifications and that sort of thing. But um, I feel like we knew how to ingest schedules. There are ag better aggregators for live events in, in the real world, but aggregators for all of these virtual events that are happening in so many dispersed areas, which is a beautiful thing. I think it's this evolutionary like explosion of, of live events and streaming and all of this, but, but there's, there's, it's difficult to, to sort of know what's going on at any given time. Mm -hmm. You make me think about prior to all of this, we used to, Everywhere we were going, if we saw anything interesting, the way we would take a, we'd capture the memory is take a picture, right? Especially when we had uh, cameras in, with our phones. Uh, I, I don't think that these days, I don't know, I could be wrong, that people are <laughs> doing sc screen recordings of everything that they're doing and everything interesting that they're finding now. Uh, so, but now that we've taken away, uh, or it's, it's kind of less interesting to, to be taking less pictures variety. of things with our phones, right? What, what is going to replace that? And how are we going to maybe shape that in, in museum exhibition design? Again, there are two, two studies that have stuck with me. Uh, one, which is when you show people something new, especially in an art museum, often if they, if they just snap a picture of it kind of, uh, at, at, at will, they're taking pictures all the time and you ask them questions about it later, they actually don't remember it that the act of taking the photo gave their brain permission to not really remember it. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them to almost go on a scavenger hunt, go look for something that achieves A, B, or C, and then take a picture of that and then come back and share it, they, they remember it X, X times better. So it's, it's about, I think about the, the purpose of saying, here's what you should be looking for. Try to remember this. And then it works. It, there's a narrative there, right? And that narrative, that story is, is, is so, is what, you know, what really creates uh, memory, I think. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I would say about, about that kind of experience that's sl slightly adjacent though, I think um, is, is when people come back to museums, I feel like uh, there's gonna be, a, we know there's going to be reluctance to come back today. Um, I think those, uh, those sorts of, of um, activities that are accompanied by live, like live streaming from the actual locations are going to be a bit of a smoothing, buffering kind of things that we're gonna, we're gonna really need. We're gonna need to see someone in that museum, you know, walking through with maybe with other people or maybe more importantly, going through this, the new uh, procedures, the safety procedures, the hygiene um, uh, uh, efforts that have been made that, that, uh, that, that, that that's going on today and that I'm gonna go to the museum, but I really wanna see you know, what's gonna happen before I get there. And, 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 uh, and it's to the benefit of all these organizations too, that they give the preview of what to expect um, before, before getting there. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. So much of it is about the, um, the image of sanitation and safety that we, we put forward. And I don't know how it was for the two of you, but personally, even more than both the scientific facts that I was reading and even the government recommendations, the thing that made the difference that changed my behavior when I started wearing masks and gloves was seeing other you know, normal people, people like me, when nobody else was doing it. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just a sheep, but I, I was like, Oh, well, no, nobody else is doing it. Uh, but then it, as soon as it, it tipped and everybody was wearing them, you go, Oh yeah, it, it, it's now the strange thing to not wear them. And so I think totally. it's going to be the same. However, we re reintegrate is we're going to look around to what other people are doing. Uh, and I just think that's, that's how we are as 
humans I mean, will I, take our cues I, from I, other humans. I think watching people learn and adapt and, and, and change is really one of the most fascinating things about what's happening right now. You know, like just, just seeing the, the, the massive, the, the, the massive adaptations that we've all made is, is pretty incredible. It's yeah. I think we're, we're, it's very, that's the most inspiring part of, of a very, very difficult time is we're learning that we do, we do want to pick up new habits and we can actually rather quickly, you know, that first month um, people were fumbling around, like you were saying, the sense of time was all, all over the place because we were readjusting. And now as we're, as we're getting some footing, we're, we're actually choosing really interesting new ways of, of being present and I guess maybe that's maybe that would be my concluding question for our chat today is, you know, what do you think what do you think we'll cherish now when, when we get back out into the world? What are we going to cherish the most? I miss hugs. Oh, I was going to say exactly uh, the same yeah. thing, Nathan. I swear to God, yeah. I was going to say I want to hug somebody like. <laughs> that that yeah. doesn't live in and my I'm, I wasn't even a. I didn't <laughs> consider myself a big hugger, but man, that right? is crazy. No, I totally. Somebody. That that human connection. I mean, I think that there's a there's so many like worries about about all the things that are going to be broken when we get back into the world. But there's such a desire to like get back together and see each other and and whether we have to have masks or not, whatever, that's going to be hopefully temporary and, and, and all that. But man, there, there is going to, well, I think we're seeing it last weekend. We're seeing this, this, this desire to re to re uh, uh, reconnect. And, and so I feel the same way. That gives me so much hope because in the beginning I was worried that we would just, slip into loneliness and isolation and the new normal would just be everybody alone watching Netflix. And, and I'm sure isolation and loneliness was a real thing for a lot of people before this. And it probably still is. But what, what gives me hope is seeing all of the creativity and the, the energy that people have put into finding ways to connect with other people. It's been amazing. And also what's interesting is that it's the, the playing field has been leveled for, for getting that kind of creativity out, you know, uh, Trevor, Noah and talk show hosts, true. they have to perform and try and be as creative as they can from their homes, just like the rest of us. So it's like, we're, we're all in this, the same circus together. I totally agree. I mean, the Twitch and Facebook live and Instagram of the world makes us all broadcasters and, and it's, it's, it's quite an amazing thing to take in. Yeah. It's what really wonderful. Well, that's the most hopeful thing ever. I really like that. I look forward to going back out in the world and, yeah, hugging everyone. <laughs> that's great. Oh, great. Well, thank you both so much. This has been an amazing chat, and uh, I'm really excited to see what happens next and what we make memorable in the future. So thanks again for joining Kirsten, me. Kirsten, thanks for bringing us together. Uh, Nathan, yeah, thanks for a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Thanks for listening to the Tide Generator Podcast, produced by Avixa. Find it wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.